Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by The Mosaic Company. Welcome to this episode of the Soil School on Real Agriculture. I'm Kelvin Hepner, and pleased to be joined by Keith Byerly. Keith is the sustainability lead for Mosaic, and we're focusing on the topic of soil health. And Keith, when you hear that term, what does it mean to, to you from your perspective and your position? So when I hear the term soil health, ultimately what I'm thinking about is sustainability. Um, uh, the, the two terms don't necessarily overlap in their entirety, but when I think sustainability, I think about the ability to meet the world's need for food, fuel, fiber, and fuel while we protect our soil resources, we protect our water resources, and we do all that in a manner that is economically viable for our, our operators and ensures that generational uh, success happens on that farm. It can go from one generation to another. And while, again, they don't overlap entirely, soil health being a lot of those same components for the soil is really the, the heart of sustainability and, and thinking about that on a farm. Mm -hmm. And whether we're in Iowa or Nebraska, North Dakota, soil health also differs from field to field. Soil health is absolutely a very personal idea from grower to grower. One grower's success in soil health might be their ability to eliminate or, or really minimize the impacts of wind erosion, for instance. And, and they do that through a green cover crop. And the next grower 20 miles up the road or across the fence is thinking about being able to get through longer dry spells that we have as, as rain patterns are a little bit different than they were 20 years ago and things like that. So they might be using cover crops to build those channels in their soil and, and reducing the tillage and, and all of those exact same things that that grower across the fence is, but they're coming at it from two completely different avenues, two different end goals in mind, but the same set of practices to get there. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, what does that mean for farming practices and, and the decisions that growers will have to make when it comes to optimizing yields and, and maximizing production based on the, the nutrients that we do make available to the crop? So when you're mosaic fertilizer and you're thinking about this challenge a lot of people automatically assume that soil health and and this whole idea is going to be something that leads to nutrient reduction we're going to put on less fertilizer than we have in the past and i think that there's a component of that, that that's absolutely proper thinking but at the same point in time it's equally likely that we're going to go ahead and improve our use efficiencies, whether it's phosphorus use, nitrogen use. We're going to look at how we grow 20% more food, 20% more fuel, 20% more fiber off of the same land resources that we have today, utilizing the same water, nutrients, all of those things to improve the efficiency of our system. And at the end of the day, if we're meeting the global demand and doing it with less carbon dioxide, less methane, less nitrous oxide, meeting those ecosystems market demands and meeting the world's demand for food and, and fuel and fiber in a cost-effective way, but doing it with the same sort of resources that we're doing today, that's a win as well. Mm -hmm. So technology and the advancement there in terms of innovation on the fertilizer product side of things, I guess, plays a role in that. T technology is absolutely going to come into the fertilizer world and be part of our daily lives the same that it has in the seed, it, same as it has in the cab of that tractor or combine. Technology is, is just a daily component of our lives. So we might see technology in fertilizer, meaning that we're putting together better crop nutrition that looks at releasing fertilizer as a crop's demands might deem it. At the same point in time, we have to think about the changing environment that that fertilizer might be asked to perform in. And I don't necessarily mean the environment and the weather, but more so when we implement cover crops into a system or we reduce tillage out of a system, things like that, that's a different sort of demand on our soils and our crop nutrition. So one of the things that we talk about and one of the things that's gonna become more and more familiar for growers is not the idea that all nutrition is crop nutrition, but the idea that we are working on a system nutrition aspect. You look at that fertilizer that that fertilizer application is not just for the cash crop but also 
How do those nutrients work and get recycled by the cover crop? How does the recycled nutrients through the cover crop feed back into the next cash crop? And that's where the local resources, the trusted advisor that the grower has becomes incredibly important because those local trusted advisors are the ones that understand the weather systems. They understand what a new variety of crop into a grower's rotation might mean for that demand on the system from a nutritional standpoint. Yeah. Finally then, Keith, along with the focus on soil health, we're also seeing increased focus every day on carbon sequestration and carbon markets, opportunities for farmers there, both in the, the private market and also in some cases government driven. What does that mean for, uh, or how does that relate to this focus on soil health? Yep. So as we look across the ecosystems markets, carbon, methane, nitrous oxide, as those markets continue to emerge, what we really see is that they almost offer the opportunity for the cherry on top for our growers. Um, the incentive of a few dollars an acre is often very beneficial to a grower. It helps offset the cost of implementing a cover crop or changing out a, a tillage implement or, or changing planter technologies, things like that. But at the same point in time, it's seldom enough of an incentive to get a grower to make wide scale or sweeping changes to their operation. So if a grower is, is looking at 4R management as part of their operation and there's an ecosystems component to that, that's a fairly easy adoption for a grower to undertake. At the same point in time, if a grower gets told that they have to plant all or part of their farm into cover crops, that ecosystems market components probably not enough incentive to move them there by themselves it's when the grower sees the long-term benefit in soil health they see that building that resource building that organic matter if i can invest in the next 15 or 20 years to add another percent of organic matter to my farm to leave the next generation more nutrient resources more water holding capacity all of those components to my soil fantastic i've left the land in a better condition than potentially i maybe got it from and that's where soil health and these ecosystems markets all come together to kind of be the pull and the push at the same time that i'll get the same direction of movement going yeah a lot of the goals or outcomes i think are actually go hand in hand whether we're boosting soil carbon, whether we're improving water infiltration, reducing erosion, a lot of that ties together. It's the, the same outcome in the end. Absolutely. We're all pulling in this same, same idea that ultimately at the end of the day, we need to be more efficient in our crops. We need healthy soil that, that stays put and is the same soil that's out there in another generation or two generations and whatever the means are to that end whatever the driving force is from farmer to farmer that's fine it, whatever is personal to you whatever drives you to make that investment in soil health that's where we're going with this that that's why it's important is what's important to each and every grower yeah Lots to think about as we think about how this applies to our own farms, I think. So thanks for your time and, and your insight today, Keith. Thanks for having me out. 